I greet you in the name of the Lord. Today, I just want to talk about the contemporary Christian world missions. The world mission comes in a way of the different world, the global missions, whatever it is called. When Jesus went up the Mount to Olive, and the disciples asked him that when it will be the end time, and Jesus talks about it, that you will hear the rumors of the words and earthquakes and disasters and others. And the Lord Jesus says that, in according to Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. The gospel of the Lord must be preached in the whole world as a testimony to the all nations. And this is a mandate and given by Christ. So the gospel must be preached to the every nation, and in people and tribe and the language. And this is the reference to the missions that the, any organization and church and individual must have this great commission from Christ that according to uh, Matthew 28, if you are able to know that the Christian world mission is given everybody, not to the missionary alone, to the some Christian believers and community people, but all those who believe in Christ are given this great commission. So there are four things that we have to understand when it comes to Christian world mission. The first one is actually over here to spread the message of the gospel. The second one is to uh, the people around you who never heard the gospel is the one you have to share. And the third one is to make them disciples of Christ. And a fourth, to establish the church of Jesus Christ. So therefore, world mission is to be actually to every nation and in people. So the terminology here that the global mission is using is to all nations. The all nations, the reference first comes from the book of the Revelation. And actually, this is the, uh, the, uh, the meaning of what uh, we call the ethnos. But in according to uh, Revelation chapter 9, uh, chapter 7, verse 9, it says that after I looked and there before me was a greater multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. So before me was a great multitude. Uh, the, every nation, every people, every tribe, every tongue will bow before the Lord and cast down the crown before his feet. But the great multitude here in the Greek is Kaio for Lux Oxlos. That means it's like the culture, sometimes not only the multitude, the peoples and ethnic groups and tribes and company or race. So here, in the indication of the uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, the multitude of men who have flocked together in some place from, there is one more additional word, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. The gospel must be preached to every nation and people in tribe the language. So this is the mandate it's given to us by Jesus Christ. So the gospel to all nations are very important. And here in the book of the uh, Matthew, the nation, people, language, and tribe is in the Greek is actually ace, masturion, Passing toys ethnic. The ethnic is the actual from ethnos. So ethnos today, the many of us are very easily understand the meaning of the ethnic, but sometimes people and language and tribe. So Matthew is very uh, Matthew 28, 19 to 20 is uh, indicating very important Bible verses. So let me read it for you. 
Jesus commanded his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded to you. So here it says that go and make disciples, the number one, and seek the people and go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching people to obey everything what Jesus has commanded. There are four things of seek, discipling, baptizing, teaching, in a way that as we are given the Great Commission for the World Mission. So we are able to understand the Great Commissions according to Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. So, but this gospel of the Lord is not only to the one tribe, but that every tribe, every nation, every people, every language. But however, when the gospel of the Lord was studied in Jerusalem, and in the whole area, as we see that the gospel spread all over the world, it's not actually the utmost part of the world. According to Ralph Winter, he said that, you know, there are ways that the five epochs of the redemptive ministry, so the first the 400 years from the church in Jerusalem to spread the gospel all of the Roman Empire. So this is Romans who were able to receive the gospel of the Lord. And then when the Roman Empire fell upon the hands of the barbarian, the Ardeke, that the barbarians like German barbarians and other European barbarians were able to receive the gospel of the Lord. So that's the next 400 years. Then the next 400 years, the Vikings, the Nordics, the Scandinavian people were able to receive the gospel of the Lord. When there was ascendancy of Islam, the Saracens and the nearby people were able to hear the gospel first time. So after the Reformation, 1517, by Martin Luther, actually there was a little later, but the Reformation didn't begin the global mission, but the actually new discovery of the world by so-called great age of the voyage were able to have the colonial mission. So that's the next 400 years beginning from the 1600s up to now. So this is the end of the earth. The gospel must be preached to the every nation to the ends of the earth. So we must proclaim the gospel of the Lord to the every nation, every people, every tribe, every tongue. But the world mission actually, beginning from this, the church in Jerusalem up to now, takes more than 2,000 years. But to every part, every corner, and every people in the world must hear the gospel. So this is the actually the mandate the given from Christ. So we are doing right now the last part of the uh, fifth epoch, according to Ralph Witter. So let me share with you the brief the transitions, the Christian mission in history. As we know that the gospel of the Lord the preached in, in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria and some part of the uh, Middle Eastern area and also the Mediterranean world. So that's the early church we are able to understand. When this gospel spread to the uh, European nations in the Middle Ages, we call the mostly monasticism, the, it's the one share the gospel to the villages and communities in the European territory. The most important, the part of the monastery mission is actually strongly emphasized by Irish monks. So they were able to, uh, they are the ones to share the gospel in, in Germany, in Switzerland, and other part of the world. So the Middle Ages is not emphasized in global mission much though. And before the Reformation in 1517, the, we call it actually pre-modern mission. The pre-modern mission it's not strongly emphasized in other parts of the world, rather the European. But after 
the uh, Reformation, we call it the, the modern world began. The, the press mission were not emphasized except the northern part of the North America and some cases Southern Hemisphere in Latin America. Through the way the colonial missions actually spreading the Christian gospel. So there is, you know, particularly strong by the Catholic missions, but the very rare. The progressive missionaries actually share the gospel in a different part of the world, although the Native American world shared by the Christians, by the progressive people. Here, they, after the uh, modern missions, we are able to know the, uh, another one so-called the postmodern mission. So the postmodern mission is more likely after the Second World War, and, and then the, at the end of the actually, uh, the uh, uh, global digesters. So the first world and second world, the, the, uh, the part, and then, you know, the colonial missions ended you know, at the end of the uh, second world war. So we called it postmodern mission at the same time, postcolonial mission. Now we are standing in the 2023 as we see, this is a 21st century mission. So there are different concepts and there are different stages of the uh, global mission in, in history. Early church mission, monastery missions, pre-modern missions, and modern mission, post-modern, and post-colonial and 21st century mission. So let me give you this, the uh, modern mission first. Although the, after the Reformation in 1517 by Martin Luther, you know, the most of the missions are focused on European territory, the Nordic countries and some of the German kingdoms. So many of you know that the uh, modern mission began by William Carey. The William Carey was the one that 1792, the declaring the Christian mission has to be focused in the heathen world. That's the actually in India and the part of the other part of the world. So the British Empire began in India, so we call it East India Company. And there are other territories. So William Carey is the first Baptist missionary to focus on the soul winning in foreign land. And then according to the challenge of the William Carey, we call the hasty prayer movements at the Williams College. The Samuel Mills and other students praying for the world missions, and that's the actually ABC FM begun. The American Board of the Commissioners in Foreign Missions. So these are the ones first that started the ascending the missionary movements by American six denominations. So this is the right after the second awakening. So the hasty prayer movements goes together with the spiritual movements among the campus revival in the time beginning from the 1800. Then, of course, this the modern mission begun by the William Carey and others, mostly European dominance. And but that there are other waves, so-called the inland mission. But the inland mission. It's a little bit different from the coastland missions. A coastland mission means seashore missions because China, India, and Africa, the, the many part of the world do not have any access into the inland, but rather they have actually coastline, the Sudan missions and African uh, seashore missions and, uh, you know, the, um, uh, China, so the OMF, actually, you know, there is China Inland Mission, but before that, like Kwangtong, Shanghai, Taiyuan, you know, the many uh, so-called seashore lands are the one who receive the missionaries, but they were not able to have them in a land. But the later on, the, between the 1865 to 1980, there were the inland missions, so it's the missionary were able to go deep in the land, like in Africa, like in, in South Asia, and then also in China, it's North East Asia and Southeast Asia, like Indonesia and the Philippines and others. So these inland missions are focused by, like more likely 
the Americans, but the Hurston Taylor, the British, but the faith mission agencies have begun. And today, the China Inland Mission now they turning into the the OMF, and you know the, there are other mission agencies begun by the time. So American dominance begun by this time rather than the European dominance. So the gospel to the whole nation is actually preaching the gospel to the many people, nations, and tribe language. But you know when the Americans and the European came together and searched for the collaboration by means of the, some of the key leadership, John Mort, and you know, the, uh, uh, he is the actually American representative, but in Europe, the mostly in the British people, actually organized the uh, world mission in Edinburgh, so we call 1910 Edinburgh World Mission. So, the catchphrase is to evangelize these people, evangelize the world, including nations and people and tribes and language. So that's the evangelize the world in this generation. That's the catchphrase, gospel to all nations as evangelizations. So 1910 Edinburgh World Mission is the first one inviting the mission agencies the representative, and also denominational leader all come along the nine nights and 10 days conference seeking together the way that the whole world must be evangelized. So the world mission, the global mission, focus on the evangelization. So what do you mean, or the, what is your definition by the evangelizations? You know, and actually it was not clear though, but the first one is let everyone hear the gospel. So that's why we have to share the gospel, whether they believe in Jesus Christ or not, you know, whatever the way that we can share by means of going there or giving tracts and, and whatever the way people may hear the gospel, you know, that's the, actually the way of the evangelization. But how much percent were able to receive Christ? There is no category though, but the people who never heard the gospel must hear the gospel by actually proclamation. So Edinburgh Conference was looking for that way that between the two continents, the European continents and the North American continent coming along together, that this are very white centered and in Western centered, and this is very much also the collaboration of focus on evangelization as global mission is defined. So 1921, the International Mission Council was formed in a way that the denominations and mission agencies came together in seeking for the global endeavor collaboratively. However, the First World War, the Second World War broke out and the European people were killed one another, the Christian nation against the Christians, German Christian nations, German fought against the Britain, America, France, and others. The Christian fought the Christian. So world mission was seized because the missionaries were working in, in India, and in Africa, Latin America, and the, the many part of the Asia were actually withdrawn because they were not able to continue to have the missionary work because of the World War. And they conscripted, and they have to return to their homeland, and all of the global missions stopped during the uh, two World Wars. After the World Wars, in 1948, the World Council of Churches actually declared the moratorium of the global mission the meaning that the, the churches in Europe no longer have any power or support system to send out the missionaries and, and take care of them. So therefore, this mission moratorium was declared. And you know, in the way that the Western missionaries were working you know, in Africa and in India, in China, of course, China, in 1949, the great expulsion happened at the Mao Chiotong. Actually expelled all of the Western missionaries in the land and in China. They had to, uh, you know, actually go out. And so, in all of the world, and not only 
in Asia and in Africa, the many part of the Latin America one no longer have the Western missionaries. So after the, uh, the mission moratorium declared, uh, you know, the, all of the world, the Western missionaries largely gone, disappeared in the colonial part. And then many colonial nations became the independent. And so it seemingly world mission stopped. When John Stott, Dr. Billy Graham, actually called on the evangelical came together in the city of the Lausanne in Switzerland and called on the Lausanne movement in 1974. And very young scholar, the missionary who were working in Latin America came in and said that we have so many, so many ethnic groups in the world. As I said, the gospel must be to preach it to the nations. A nation can be interpreted into ethnics, races, language, and tribe. So he said there are 24,000 ethnic groups in the world, and 12,000 people already know the gospel. The rest of the 12,000 people, the ethnic group never heard the gospel according to Dr. Ralph Winter. It shocked the congregations and participants in the conference. So 1974, the Lausanne movement declared that the, the Christian mission has to refocus and restart. And this is the one of the major turning point because the Christian mission has to, it's no longer uh, just holding on the mission moratorium, the rather we have to go many uh, area where the uh, unriched people are living in, in the part of the world. So the unriched people was focused in the time and as a result of this the Lausanne movements in Switzerland. And the most of Christian mission start again to send out the missionaries and also the preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to unriched people. Then Dr. Louis Bush also declaring that the most of unriched people living in, in 1040 window. So the latitude of 10 degree, the span between the 10 degree to the 40 degree in the north are the area, the, 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 the least evangelized people living in, in, in Asia. And this is strong blocks of the three world religion, so-called Islam, Buddhist, and in Hinduism. Therefore, these are the ones are very rarely received and have an opportunity to listen to the gospel. So now, and then we are turning into the 20th century, the global mission. So the world mission, as we see there at the beginning from the church in Jerusalem to Romans and barbarians and the uh, Vikings and, and, and then the, the nearby, but now the every part of the world. The, you know, until we coming into postmodern mission or until we coming into the unriched people mission, the most of world mission is called white man's burden. The white man's burden is coming from the poem. You know, this poem is actually called the uh, Rudyard Kipling when the uh, United States of America were annexed to the Philippine archipelago after liberating them from 330 years of the uh, Spanish colonialism. So he made, a, the, he made a beautiful poem and it said the take of the white man's burden sent forth the best you breed and go bind your sons to exile to serve your captive needs, to wait in a heavy harness on flooded parks and wild, your new court, the sullen people, half devil, half child. But you know, this, this poem goes on the longer. So this white man burden is mostly Western missionary centered and also the mostly European and American dominance and also, this is the way that the white man has to take the responsibility.
But as you see, the Unreached People missions, you know, declared by the Dr. Larp Winter, and also the Lausanne movement began to proclaim the gospel of the Lord to the Unreached People together with, you know, the re-originating the mission mandate. The global mission is no longer white man's burden, but this missionary mandate is to everyone, no matter who you are. So it is quite important, the global mission is in transitions, refocusing on the unwretched people at the same time, the burden must be shared together among anybody who are in Christ. So this is the very striking. And as you know that the uh, global mission until the 1910 world mission in Edinburgh, in a European and North American uh, white man burden. But in 2021, actually the 100 years later, the uh, Edinburgh World Mission Conference, and also 2010, Lausanne Movement began the Lausanne Congress in Cape Town. So the 4,000 the participants coming from 198 countries participating together. But if you're looking at the variety of ethnicities, the Africans and Latin Americans and Asians, along with the European and American missionaries and, and leaders came together. I participate also the centenary of the uh, Edinburgh World Mission in Scotland. You, know, you could see that, you know, 1910, 1,200 European, there were no any African or Asian, but, you know, there are some observers, but they are not actually regular participants there. But, you know, after the hundred years, you could see the different races, different Asians and Africans and Latinos participating in the conference. You could see that the transition between, you know, the ratio of the people before it was a really white man burden, but nowadays anybody, you know, anybody in Christ can share the gospel, the gospel to call to all. So here in 2023, the global mission is no longer white. It's a non-white and multi-ethnic and non-Western and defendant, indigenous, and then the Pentecostal charismatic in character and a digital mission that's also not the physical mission, but there are ways that we can use cyberspace to share the gospel of the Lord. And also the fourth industrial revolution mission. So, you know, this is more likely augment reality. There are the artificial intelligence. You know, there are many of the AOT, IOT, and different way of the uh, digital missions combined together, you know, the sharing the gospel of the Lord and this is a new way that we are able to share and proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the whole of the world. So the Christian mission in the majority world, you know, before we said that the first world is European and North America, second world, the communist bloc, third world, mostly like the global south. But the United Nations defined that the global south and global east can be as the majority world. So the two thirds of the world Christians now living in the global south. So before the 90% of Christians living in the north and then mostly also in the west, Europe and North America. Nowadays, more than 60% of Christians close to the two thirds of the world Christians living in the global south. And you know the, why this uh, majority world Christian missions uh, actually refocus on the global uh, south because there are more numbers of the believers rather than the Western world. So there has been the number of the rapid church growth in global south, the majority world. The evangelism was focused, and then the Pentecostal and charismatic grow so rapidly. And also the supernatural manifestation, the divine healing, and also the different part of the signs and wonders took place among many churches. As we know that was the vibrant worship is the one of the character that the church started grow so rapidly, and in a strong emphasis on the uh, the prayer and spiritual warfare in Africa, Latin America, and in Asia. 
And there are some emphasis on the supernatural manifestation. And then, like Nigeria, Kenya, you know, the countries like the uh, Brazil, you know, not, not only South Korea, but the Philippines, and Indonesia, and Malaysia, the many countries began to send out missionaries. So the emerging, the global mission movement began. So this is what we see the majority of world Christianity. So, however, you know, the majority was still the poverty stricken and the concern for justice is one of the primary thing and a more conservative belief in morals among the Catholics and strong the uh, Marian devotions. You, you know, the number of Catholics and the Orthodox still stick into the uh, traditions. More likely free European ancient Christianity like that in, in Africa, we call the ancestral worship and also their very supernatural worldview. And there are the way that, you know, a lot of the Latinos and Africans are not, you know, actually used to be what European and North American, in a way that their rationalistic approach are accustomed. But they rather have the supernatural orientation. And that's why they become very identical with the Pentecostal character in a way that the prayers and also divine healings and, you know, the miracles and signs and wonders in different way what they receive. So this is, you know, more long, uh, more likely, um, the, uh, uh, the DNA, I mean, the uh, spiritual gene uh, become very identical with that. So the Pentecostal church is growing in, in the South and in custom rejected by North, like, you know, the ancestral worships and sacrifices and full gospel missions and others. You know, these are actually very practices, uh, you know, the practices in, 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 in their belief, you know. And they naturally believed in a kind of supernatural power, miracle, healing in their life. So... World mission is very much newly emerging, coming from the majority world. So let me give you uh, some of the things that as we're looking at the, uh, the present and current situation, what we are able to do. The world population today is, you know, account for the 7.9 billions in 2021. It's close to 8 billion right now. The one third call themselves Christians because, as we know, that the 20, uh, you know, 2.2, the uh, 2.2 billion Christians account, but, you know, including Catholics and Orthodox and Protestants. Uh, the Protestants, a little more than 700 million, but the Catholics, much more, like 1.2 billion, and the rest, uh, I think, Orthodox and other denominations. So, one third non Christian living in a lady rich people group. So we are able to see that the one third remaining live in an enriched people group. So we can see that the enriched people, you know, enriched people group is only the one third, you know, as we're looking at the global population. So let's look at that where the Christians are living in the world. North America, including nominal, you know, don't believe that they are, this is a great commission Christian or, you know, committed Christian. And this including the nominals and, you know, just like the um, so-called the um, sympathizer. But anyway, the North America uh, account for the 20, 210 million uh, Christians and in 2021, so the 63% of the population the Christians in America alone, the more Catholic, the half the number of the uh, Christian people account for the Catholic, and the Protestants is much lower and than others included. In Europe, 553 million Christians in 2010, but it uh, you know, goes a little declining after the years, including the nominals. So the 64% of the populations are the Christians. Latin America, 612 million in 2018. The 83% of the population belongs to Christian category, mostly Catholics. The Africa is in terms of the Christian population has the greatest number. So actually 685 million in 2021. 
it's account 49% of the population as Christians identified. Asia is the least evangelized. 383 million Christians living in Indonesia in 2021. It is account 12% poor, 12.6% Christian population percentage. So here you are able to looking at the uh, uh, world map that among the Christians and religions most in sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and the United States and in Asia. You are able to looking at that the United States, most likely in the United States, told us 68%, Canada, 39%. Brazil is 77% of Christian population, but Colombia is, is a little higher than the Brazil, but the Honduras is the highest one of 94% Catholics and some of the Protestants. Ecuador and Peru, Bolivia, Chile, Argentina. It's all very great number of the people belong Catholic and evangelical. But in sub-Saharan Africa, like you know, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, you know, the South Africa, in Nigeria, you know, Republic of Congo, Zambia, you know, Ghana, uh, all those nations, a very high proportion of the Christian people. Europe, as you know, the decline of the attendees, though, but the nominal Christians still high. So the Denmark, the 9%, UK, 11%, Germany, 12%, France, the 12%, and Spain, 30%, Greece, 58%. And then, you know, the island is one of the highest nations, and including the Poland. So these are the one, the Christian population living in, in the world. So missionary proportions actually striking for us that there are 430,000 missionaries from all branches of Christianity, including Catholicism, Orthodox, and Protestantism. So here, the great number of the missionaries working, coming from the Catholics, you know, so these are the ones. But only between 2 to 3 percent of those missionaries walk among the unriched people. But out of the 430,000 missionaries from the all branches of the Christianity, only 140,000 Protestant missionaries working in the world. So there are also number of the missionaries coming from different part of the world, South Korea, Brazil, UK, Germany, and Netherlands, and others. But the greatest number of the missionaries coming from Protestant mission agencies is the United States of America. So 140,000 Protestant missionaries coming from the United, uh, you know, sorry, 140,000 Protestant missionaries walking all over the world, but 65,000 the Protestant missionaries coming from the United States and walking all over the world. So the Brazil is a little more than 40,000 missionaries, South Korea, 35,000. So the Korea has been the number two for a long time, but Brazil took over in lead. Now, the Brazil is second largest missionary sending country in the world after the United States. So these are the one actually working. So if you're looking at including the Catholics and Orthodox, 227,000 missionaries coming from the global north still. But in 1970, 80% of missionary from global north. But in 2021, it dropped so rapidly, 53% of the, all of the missionaries coming from the all branches of the Christianity coming from the global north. So you could see that the transitions and changes right now in the world. So where does the mission money go? You know, this is a very important fact that, you know, the missionaries actually need the support and donation. Approximately 87% the goes for the work among the lady Christian. And then approximately 12% of the missionary for work among a lady evangelized non-Christian. But approximately 1% work among the people group in the unevangelized or unreached people. And the most of money is close to 87% of the money coming from the global north. So the financially global south is not strong to support. So as I indicated, the temporary window 
we, which is called the uh, resistant belt that the Hinduism, Islam, and Buddhism strongly reject to accept the gospel of the Lord are located in north 10 degree and the 40 degree in the window frame. So you could see that including the uh, best land in, in Central Asia and the most part of the Asia, including North Africa. So here is the way that you are able to see that the temporary window uh, actually consists of 50 countries. And then this uh, containing 2.5 billion people, it's quite a lot. And it's stretching from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. And also the between 10 degree north and 40 degree north latitude. And the most of the world unreached people living in this 10 40 window. And the 5,000 unreached people group living in the 10 40 window. And here is actually less than 2% Christian living in. So least evangelized uh, people living in a temporary window. And as you know that the here, temporary window is major non-Christian religions, including Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, and irreligious people and communism. So the challenge to global mission today in as of the 2023, you are able to see that the Islam is a major challenge and still the fastest growing religion in the world. And also, Within our evangelicals and in the Protestantism, there has been a number of the factions and denominationalisms actually dividing ourselves and not to be united. And the secularism, humanism, and the liberalism as a strong resistance against the five fellow of the biblical fundamentals as we believe in, in the Bible. So, and the folk religions, the popular religions are actually bringing the hybrid and syncretism. It's like in Brazil, Argentina, in Chile, and also the many part of the Asian countries and in, in mostly sub-Saharan Africa. You know, there are numbers of the ancestral worships, you know, the practices of the ancient religion combining together with the Christian practices. It's called the syncretistic religions among the many emerging Christian independent churches in the many part of the majority world are uh, actually you know, growing so much. So the religious pluralism in, in the North and also the some part of the many different part of the world allowing that the salvation is not actually along the Bible and the gospel, but there are many ways that we can have the salvation. The religious pluralism is another strong challenge to us. And the lack of the acknowledgments on other religions, meaning that we don't understand the Hinduism, we don't understand Buddhism deeply, we don't know the, what Islam means. So there are no the penetration or breakthrough happening as we do not know because of the negligence and ignorance to our starters. Here, the theological differences, you know, as you see that the uh, Reformed theology, Harlanist theology, Wesleyan theology, and Pentecostal theology are so different from one another and in bringing us not to unity, but as the divided more. So let's look at the uh, very different part of the world and in Africa and in Asia and in Latin America very briefly. African Christianity is the, one of the major part that, you know, the fastest Christian religion wherein the people really received Christ. As I said that, you know, in Africa is an amazing nation because in the beginning of the 1900, you know, the Christian population was not much though, only there are only 10 million believers in the 1900. But before that, you know, it's a Sudan inland missions and African inland missions and, you know, different part of the uh, missions, David Livingston's and, you know, the, all of these uh, amazing missionary movements and in the 1800. But however, you know, the, the colonies gained and independence in the mid 1900, the Christian grow from the 10 million in the dawn of the 1900 to the 2021, 
to 685 million. So yeah, this is actually fastest uh, Christian growing continent in the world. Africa has been, you know, the place of the, uh, you know, the evangelism explosions and, you know, the uh, so-called the fantastic Christian growth take place in many parts of the uh, sub-Saharan Africa. We expect that in two years later, in 2025, there will be 660 million Christians in Africa alone. This will be the major Christian populated people living in Africa. So today, the major denomination like Catholics and Anglicans and, you know, the Pentecostal churches, AIC, the African Independent Churches or African Initiated Churches, you know, these are the very strong, but controlled by Islams, you know, the Islam in the bands in many areas like Ethiopia, you know, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, you know, the many part of the African nations have the great advance of the Islamic growth. So the Nigeria, 50% Muslims and 40, more than 40%, close to 49% Christians. Somalia Muslim, Ethiopia, 45% Muslims and 40% Christians. So these are the one you are able to looking at that, you know, there are a number of the different part of the world. If you're looking at the map, you know, this, the North Africa mostly, Muslim, you know, there was no any breakthrough taking place in, in the land. So Christians are very few still. Tunis, Libya, and then, you know, part of the, um, actually, uh, Algier, Mauritania, and then, you know, Chad, Mali. You know, many nations, you know, just, it's, it's really hard to find the Christian community there. But sub-Saharan Africa, amazingly, the Christians are growing. So if you're looking at the dark blue, that's between the 75 to 95 percent of Christians living in, in that area in, by 2000. And then, you know, the, uh, some countries like the, uh, here, you know, Tanzania, you know, the part of the, uh, uh, other countries like Mozambique, you know, between the 50 to 75 some Christian living in. So the most of the African countries in the sub-Saharan regions are Christianized. It's, 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 it's a greatest news to us. So let's look at that, you know, how the Africa is able to look at that, you know, the, the way that the religious affiliation and happening. And then let's look at the uh, Latin America. Latin America is called the Catholic continents, but now the poorest missionaries are growing so much though. On the right hand, the 55% Catholic and then 22% the Protestants. But out of the 22% the Protestants and 16% of Evangelicals. So Evangelicals are quite strong and 5% mainline the Protestant missions like the Presbyterian and Methodist and others. So the Protestant missions are so strong in Latin America, but the Catholic also, you know, very declining in numbers because there is a transfer from Catholic to the Protestant, mostly the evangelicals. But the most of the evangelicals are Pentecostal in character. So Latin America in the year 1995, if you look at the, uh, the map that, you know, it's more than 50%, 60%, and it's, it's most of countries are uh, actually Catholic dominant nations. But in 2017 on the right, you see that, you know, it's a great number of the Catholic turning into the Protestant religion. Therefore, like Brazil, you know, there's some part of the uh, Venezuela, Colombia, and in the Ecuador, you know, Honduras, and Guatemala, and El Salvador, uh, become more Christian, uh, the Protestant countries rather than the Catholic. And these are the big changes taking place in Latin America. If you're looking at the map here over here, you know, you are able to looking at that, uh, like, you know, the many Protestant countries were raised as a Catholic. Colombia, Paraguay, Peru, Ecuador, you know, more than 60 to the 70 percent, and the Bolivia, and the Venezuela, Argentina, Brazil, you know, most race as Catholic and turning into Protestant. So 
Brazil is the greatest, you know, the, uh, the Protestant country in, in, in Latin America in terms of the Christian population. Of course, in, in Central America, Honduras and El Salvador, Guatemala and Panama, you know, mostly the Christianized as the evangelical grow so much. And Chile, Argentina, and Paraguay also have the great number of the uh, evangelical believers right now. So let me share with that, you know, before, if you're looking at the three different parts of the uh, religion, the Catholic, the Brazilian, 54%, but nowadays the Protestant believers by 25%, one in four are the evangelical in Brazil. That's a really great. And then, you know, if you're looking at that, uh, Brazil, not only Brazil, but also the part of the El Salvador, Honduras, and in Guatemala, and some part of Mexico. You know, there has been a great uh, uh, growth of the uh, evangelical uh, population. So let me share with you the uh, Asia. So we briefly look at that in Africa and Latin America, but Asia is the greatest continent in the world. So you are able to looking at that there are, there are the 4.561 billion population as of the 2018. And the Christian population is the least, but the 386 in comparison to, you know, the great number, the more than 600 million Christians in Africa and, and in Latin America, but Asia is, you know, the half, although the population much, much great to combine all together because a two third of the population living in a nation. The Christian population, including Catholics and Orthodox and, and all those of the branches of the, uh, the Protestant denominations uh, by 12.6% year 2014. So Asia is not evangelized well. So in Asia, it's close to 5,000 ethno-linguistic people, 5,000. So that's the 5,000 unreached people living in an Asian continent. And 28% of the world, 71 ethno-linguistic families living in Asia. 80% of the affinity blocks of the people living in Asia. And 4.5 billion people living in Asia in 2018, but 386 million Christians, you know, by the percentage of the 12.6%. The Protestant population represents only 6%. Here, the Muslims, you know, 26 points, 42 percent living in Indonesia. Hinduism, Hindus in, in India, 22 point 86 percent, and non-religious 16 point 28 percent, and a Buddhist 11 point 32 percent living in Indonesia. So the most of you know re, uh, resistant belt living in Indonesia, and in largely three major religions living in Indonesia. So Asia is the least evangelized continent in the world. So Christianity in Asia, there are four characters. The first one, the East Asia is represent only 1% Christians. You know, it's not many though, but you know, in, in China alone, although, you know, there are uh, close to 800 million underground churches, and then there are also close to uh, 38, 35, million, the uh, three self churches, you know, approved and recognized by the Chinese Communist Party. But Korea, you know, it's like the Protestants and, you know, 22 to 25 percent and the Catholic 17 percent. It's, you know, 38 to 40 percent of uh, the population in South Korea the Christianized. But, you know, Southeast Asia, like a Philippine, the only Christian nation in Asia because most the majority of them, actually the Catholics. But as you know, the 9% of the Protestant believers in, in, in the Philippines, Indonesia is amazing, largest Muslim country in the world though, but there are a great number of the believers, you know, close to a seven to 9% of the Christian populations. And it's spanning from the Orthodox and the Catholics and Protestant denomination. So, not only the Indonesia, and there are a number of the Christians and in Singapore, and the great number of the believers in Malaysia. And South Asia, the India, and Sri Lanka, you know, of course, the population great though, but 
that are great numbers. You know, it's quite big numbers. You know, more than uh, 28 million uh, believers in, in India alone. There are great number of the believers. You know, mostly many Catholics in Sri Lanka, although the Buddhists are number one there. In Central Asia, you know, there are Muslim countries like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan and Kyrgyzstan. And, you know, there are a number of the countries are turning into Muslim, but there are some Russian Orthodox and also emerging Protestant evangelical churches there in Central Asia. So let me share with you the God is calling us the, you know, the missions to the uh, temporary window and Asian continents. Uh, you know, there is the, uh, the best harvest calling in Indonesia and an anti-mission calling to the Asian continents and major three religious flocks in Indonesia, least evangelized and the largest in number of the uh, unrich people. So Asiatic mission collaboration needed, you know, and actually uh, combining together with the global north and the majority world missions. And we needed offering of the Holy Spirit. And that of fulfilling the Great Commission, as I said, that this gospel must be preached to the whole nations. So there should be, uh, you know, the uh, sharing of the gospel to every nation and people and tribe in the language. As you know here today, that the temporary window is refocused as we are able to sending out the missionaries. You know, here, let me try to figure it out how we are able to do, you know, here, uh, the number of the Chinese missionary, if they are going to send 50 missionaries, 50,000 missionaries, and from Korea, more than 30,000 missionaries working in an unreached people in a temporary window. If we are able to send out from the Philippines and 10,000 missionaries working together, and in, from India, uh, actually Latin America, and here in Nigeria, you know, if the uh, other people are able to send out the missionaries to unreached people in a temporary window, so Latin, from Latin America, 21,000, in Nigeria, 15,000, in India, 40,000, and in Philippines, 10,000, Korea, 30,000, and in China, 50,000, all together working in actually temporary window for the unreached people between next 15 to the 20 years evangelization in this generation will be possible. So here, let's look at the, uh, where we have the situation among the American churches to take over the responsibility of the uh, Great Commission calling. Many of you remember the America is in declining in the Christianity, though, but still the largest uh, Protestant country in the world. So. The shifting of the mission mandate coming from Jerusalem to the Europe, Europe to North America. So America has been dominant in, in the uh, 20th century. Still in 21st century, the United States of America will lead the global mission together with the majority of the world Christian missionaries. So I think that's the actually partnership we need. But however, we have the demise of the American churches in many areas. And you know, actually the church become very traditional and there are liberal Christian denominations, there are the conservatives, there are also the emerging churches, there are the charismatic churches you know, growing. So there are different atmospheres and there are different aspects of the Christian denominationalism. We have to refocus once again the mission calling to go through uh, the every nation and the people and tribe and in language. So, America has been an experience of the uh, great awakening revival in the past. The holiness movement began actually the, uh, the world missions by the Pentecostal movement seen in 1906, Ajusa revival. So America become the cultural religion, but we need to actually bring the gospel into the nations, the contextualization together in the inculturation. So 21st global mission trend in Christianity are uh, very uh, outlined by this. You know, we need globalization and, and we refocus on urban mission because of tribes and you know, enriched people coming into the uh, city center. 
And the migration is another way that we can share the gospel because people all over the world coming to the United States and into the Western world, and we can have the opportunity to share the gospel with them. And this is the Pentecostal age, and the charismatic manifestations are anywhere in the whole world. Indigenous Christianity is growing so much, not like the Western church. And inculturation is the great, uh, you know, and dire needs uh, of the gospel sharing. Let me give you the little explanation of inculturation. The contextualization is to actually bring the gospel core into different culture. And then, you know, the, uh, we have to looking at that, you know, how we modify together. Indigenization is actually expression of the gospel in the way of the indigenous, indigenous people. But inculturation, it's like, you know, two different lakes, and we don't need to bring the entire water into the another water, but we can bring just fish from other lake, and then bring this fish to the uh, another lake, but this fish can actually live in that new context. That's inculturation. Bring gospel law into different land, infiltrating in their culture, and then actually harmonize with their culture together. So brothers and sisters, we are able to looking at also the 21st century, the majority world global mission has to be our culturation. You know, the, uh, the arrogance and pride of the Western dominance must be uh, deleted. Sometimes very, you know, the clergyman centers deleted, you know, our culturation. And then sometimes we have to be aware of the danger of the folk religion and post-colonial missions. And we have to looking at the uh, Christian gospel must be expressed in the uh, different culture and different people and in their context. And uh, there has been social political change and diversity in Christianity because unlike in Martin Luther's time, unlike in the first century Jerusalem uh, context, you know, we have different branches of the Christianity at the same time, denominations and independent churches. There are a lot more of the varieties. So we call the varieties and in unity in the Christianity we need it. So here, the, we need also integral missions, so holistic missions, professional missions, and BAM businesses missions, and urban missions, and diaspora missions, and cross-cultural missions. We need a frontier missions, and a kingdom ministry we need. And actually, we need a holistic transformations. These are the one new way we call the integral mission. So what can we do? As we conclude and come to the conclusions of brothers and sisters, we need to proceed first in prayer and in intercession. And then where the majority world, like in the Philippines, Indonesia, India, China, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, we ask them to pray. Of course, Brazil, you know, the many Latin American countries begin to send the missionaries. So every country that has to respond to the call of mission must start in prayer. The prayer is the key. The intercession is the key. And then we have to mobilize the missionary candidate and then missionary recruitment, training them to be the missionaries in different part of the world, whether they are digital missionaries or the professional missionaries or the tent make missionaries. And then we need the commissioning them. And also our church we serve today must be missionary church. And then we need to partner together with the other mission agencies and denominational mission board. And also we have to take care of the missionaries and the mission care. So these are the one. So brothers and sisters, mission day is mission of God. If you're looking at the, here, the John 20, 21, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. Jesus is the one sending us to the multitudes, to every nation, to every people, to every tongue and every language. So we, has, we have to come out of the comfort zone 
and going to the mission field. But I want to say that our mission is not only going somewhere, but our next door, neighbor next to us, because the immigrant community coming to our neighbor and whole world they're actually facing together by the cyberspace. So we have a lot of the windows to share the gospel of the Lord. So the missionary is sent by God on a task. The word missionary is a Latin equivalent of the Greek apostle. So missionary is apostle, God sent, the sent one. We are sent by God. A missionary usually goes to a different cult and an ethnic group, but Paul went to Gentile, Peter to the Jews, the Galatians chapter 2, verse 8. So, you know, if the neighborhood coming from other immigration, you know, other part of the world, I think we can share the gospel of the Lord. Wherever you are, you know, there are many ways that you are able to share the gospel of the Lord. So let me give you a conclusion, brothers and sisters. A few years ago, we experienced uh, COVID-19, and this transformed and changed the whole world. Now we are turning into new normal faith mission. The prayer and intercessions of the Dionysians in on every church front door to pray together new challenge that we accomplish great commissions according to Matthew 28, 18 to 19. And also we are sent by the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. You will be my missionary. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and the utmost part of the world. And then we shouldn't be churchgoers. We must be committed Christians to the Great Commission. And also we need to have this spiritual breakthrough, a revival awakening, a dianeer in our church because not by our endeavor, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. At the same time, in a, in a changing society and community we are living in, must be adaptable, innovative, transformational, whatever the situation newly arise. So may the Lord make you to be missionaries in anywhere where you stand, because you can share the gospel of the Lord. Thank you so much for watching this video. May the Lord increase the wisdom and also the collaboration in your church, in your life. And thank you so much for having this beautiful time together with yours. Amen. <music>